Inspired by Paolo Coelho's book, The Pilgrimage, Matt Jardine decided that he wanted to put aside his daily grind and attempt a life-changing spiritual journey. A longtime fan of Japanese culture, Matt decided to attempt one of the world's most sacred trails, the 88 Temple Pilgrimage in Shikoku, Japan. In his book, The Hardest Path, Matt describes trekking over mountains, coastline, and bamboo forests to discover answers to some of his biggest questions. Jen Morris talks to Matt about his life-changing experience. Matt, your book is called The Hardest Path, a title that refers to the 88 Temple Pilgrimage that you took. Before we get into what you experienced on this journey and the life lessons that you obviously learned, let's talk a little bit about the backstory here. You all, you had always had a fascination with Japan, and you were a dedicated student of karate. Had you always known that you wanted to go out on this pilgrimage? Um, no. I've always had a—I'm trying to think back—12. I think I was 12. Could have been either way. 11, 13, but I think 12. My parents took me to a samurai exhibition in London at the Victorian Albert Museum, and I can still see the, the suits of armor, the blades, the calligraphy, and I, I just loved it. And since then, I've just had this kind of really big fascination with, with Japan, but not just the martial arts, it's sort of cultural aspect, it's spiritual aspect, and I just, I just couldn't get enough of it. I loved it. And, it, and it, that sparked it, but I think it, in some odd way, it's been in my blood since beginning of time but there's no there's no reason for it to be i'm not linked to japan in in any way apart from my my fascination well so let's get into what the concept of pilgrimage is so pilgrimage essentially the description the dictionary description it's a uh it's a sacred trail to well a number there are lots around the world but it's a hard arduous trip to a sacred place or shrine uh and it is but what i found from doing one a pilgrimage essentially is a life lived full life lived in miniature so mm. a little bit like the mayfly lives a whole life in one day so in that pilgrimage especially a, a cycle a circle pilgrimage which the 88 is because some of them are straight and this one is a, is a circle you basically will experience all that you would experience in a life in the time that you're there so mine was mine was a month and because there's nothing else to do but walk and then you get to prayer sites and pray you essentially are just walking with yourself. Uh, and uh, it's tough, very tough. So you went out on this pilgrimage in Japan. You set out on the 88 Temple Pilgrimage, to be exact. What was that journey like for you? And what does the number 88 stand for? Okay, so the 88 uh, is actually, there are 88 temple, temple sites that you need to walk to to complete the uh, circumference of the island of Shikoku. So Japan is made up of four islands. There's Shikoku, Honshu, Kyushu and Hokkaido, and the 88 is 88 temples around the circumference. It's a 1,400-kilometer walk. And there are, there are also lots of other sites called Bangai. There are about 90-odd uh, Bangai sites, but 88 are the main sites. But if you turn the number 88 on its side, certainly in, uh, in Buddhist thinking, it's the uh, symbol for infinity and constantly, you know, cycling life. I was pausing to think about the cyclical um, question that I had for you. I thought it was really interesting how you point out that the West so often views everything as like an upward climb, climbing the ladder, going up to heaven. But in the East, you say that they've really adopted a more cyclical model. How does the hmm. belief in continuation translate or show itself in the religious, spiritual, and philosophical beliefs of that region? I've thought about this a lot ever since the 88, actually. And I'm going to use the uh, philosophy that you, we use in my karate school, um, comparing sport to martial arts, because it's, it's a really clear way of doing it. Take, for example, competitive sport, okay? It's a ladder. You know you've got to the top when you've beaten all the teams ahead of you. But in martial arts, imagine this. Imagine a, um, an archery board. You see that? A big board. In the middle of that board is the bullseye, okay, which we have as the lowest belt, the white belt. Now, the next circle around that, for us, it's a red belt. It doesn't matter what art you're doing, but let's call it red for the sake of this. Now, that next uh, belt goes around the white belt. So they have two jobs, to look after their own next information on their journey, but also to envelop and look after the white belt. So it's not competitive. It's um, almost including the lower grade. And then, of course, the next belt goes around the red belt. So as you get better in martial arts, and this is the view of kind of Eastern spiritual thinking, as you get more, um, dare I say, in life, your job actually is not to raise above people, it's to include more people in those lessons. Because the idea of continuation is simple. At some point, 
you're going to meet them again. Well, so Matt, what were you hoping would happen to you or within you from the pilgrimage that you went on? I read Paolo Coelho's book. You know, uh, he wrote The Alchemist. But before that, not, not that many people have read it, he wrote a thing called The Pilgrimage, which is about his walk of the Santiago. And um, I just, when I finished that, I am definitely going to walk a pilgrimage. I'm not actually sure why, if I'm really honest. I didn't even know what I expected to get out of it. I just had an absolute desire that I was going to walk a holy trail that was going to be difficult. And, but I, but I, I really didn't know what to expect. I was even on the plane thinking, I have no idea what I'm up to, but I'm going to get off the plane and I'm going to walk and we'll just kind of take it from there. So what, what did you get out of it? Uh, it it's really easy, and I, I guard against saying this, but I'm going to say it because it's true. But it was, it was life-changing. It's such a horrible cliche, that, and I can't bear it. But it is completely true. It was life-confirming as well as life-affirming. Do you believe, though, that we all need to set out on a pilgrimage to obtain life-changing experiences or spiritual transformation? Or can we do it on a smaller scale in our daily lives? Here's the thing. I think everything we're doing is a pilgrimage. You know, the, the, the older lady who's broken her hip who has to get across the room to make a cup of tea, that's a pilgrimage. Anything where you have to dedicate yourself, where you are, because of that dedication, you are thrown, you're immersed into something that strips away thinking. In that space, you go, wow, what's that What's that open space? Now, of course, people call it all different things, right? I don't know, God or, or whatever they call it. That's, that's their business. But not, that's not my business. But that's something beyond our thinking that's found definitely through pilgrimage. Now, some people would say that they acquire that space through meditation. And I find that it's interesting that we're talking about an action creating that kind of space. Yeah. I, I, I walk it. Pilgrimage is a walk, right? Big walk. It's just a tool. If you can do it through meditation, and Zen meditation or any meditation has done that for, for centuries, absolutely. But walking ties you up. It, it's very difficult to be inactive, especially, I mean, we're born. We've got this fantastic body, right? So we're designed to move. So, you know, pilgrimage is pretty much as old as time. So tying up the body by doing something, walking, and then having nothing else to do, they kind of fit well together. So if you, if you can sit and find the same place, yeah, why not? Why not? But I think being that we're movement creatures, I think that's why the two things have been tied over time personally. You talk about the importance of always evolving as human beings. So, Matt, I have to ask you, what is the next step for you? How are you choosing now to evolve in this next chapter? So um, you are right in the middle of my next evolution, actually. I'm sitting in a car outside a school. I have a, I have a big martial arts school here in London, and we, I teach in schools, and we've got about 500 students. Okay. And I've decided to shrink my school by about 40% so that I can release days. I'm going to release three, four days to six writing projects. But I just want to create the space for, you know what I mean? The mental space, the time space. So actually, I've left the class, finished that class, handed it over to a friend so that I can continue my uh, writing career. But that's the next evolution. Yeah, writing. Oh, well, we're so happy to hear that. I want to be sure that our listeners can can learn more about you, learn how to find you um, and the book. I know that you have a website. Tell us about that. Um, so uh, we've got www, obviously, the hardest path, which is, the, which is the name of the book, thehardestpath.com. And you have a karate school website. Yeah, I do. Actually, that's uh, Jardine Karate, uh, J-A-R-D-I-N-E, the good old Scottish surname, jardinekarate.com. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And we are honored to be in this next chapter of your life. So thank you so oh, much. I'm so happy. So thank you. Thank you very much for the time. I really enjoyed chatting with you, Jen. So amazing.